Hi, welcome back to Educator.com. Today we're going to talk about probability. Consider if we want to know the chance of rain today, the odds of winning a bet, or how likely a medicine is to cure a disease. In all of these cases, we'd be asking the probability of something happening. The study of probability and chance is a major area of mathematics. It has applications throughout business, science, politics, medicine, and many other fields. Being able to know how probable an event is, how likely something is to happen, that's extremely important for a huge number of things. In this lesson, we'll go over some of the basic concepts of probability. Still, even though they're basic concepts, it it's going to be a re really interesting amount of stuff that's going to let us see some really interesting results. There's a lot of stuff here, even at the basic level. Furthermore, basic probability questions pop up a lot on standardized tests, like the SAT and other standardized tests. So if you're planning on taking any of those in the near future, this is especially useful because you're almost certainly going to see some questions that are exactly like what we're working on here, but probably even easier. And while it's not absolutely necessary to watch this lesson, we're do. Uh, it's not absolutely necessary to have already watched the previous two lessons before watching this one. We're going to draw very heavily on the previous two lessons in this lesson, so I'd really recommend watching those first if you haven't watched them. Not absolutely necessary, but it'll make things a little clearer. All right, let's go. First thing we want to define is the idea of a sample space. In the lesson on counting, we define the term event to simply mean something happening. For example, if we flipped a coin, right, we had a coin and we flipped it, we might name an event E that is the event of the coin coming up heads. Of course, there might be possibilities other than the event occurring, right? It might come up something other than heads. We call the set of all possible outcomes, everything that could happen when we do something, the sample space. If we want, we can denote the sample space with a symbol such as capital S. So in the example above, there are two possible outcomes for the sample space. One, it comes up heads, and two, it comes up tails. So there's two different possibilities, right? Because there's two different sides to the coin. So two sides to the coin, two things in our sample space. The event is simply heads coming up, but the sample space is everything that could occur. So heads and tails. Probability of an event. Let E be an event and S be the corresponding sample space. Let N of E denote the number of ways E can occur and N of S denote the total possible number of outcomes. Then, if all the possible outcomes in S are equally likely, the probability of event E occurring, denoted P of E, probability of E, is P of E equals N of E divided by N of S. Equivalently, just using words, that's the probability of an event is equal to the number of ways the event can occur divided by the number of possible outcomes. For example, in a standard 52 card deck, there are four of each card in various suits. If we draw a card at random from the deck, the chance of drawing an ace is, so the probability of the event of an ace coming up, an event of an ace coming up is there are four ways that we can get an ace out of the deck, right? There are four aces in there, so there's four ways that can happen. And there are a total of 52 card decks, so there's a total possibility, total number of possible outcomes is pulling any of those 52, so 4 over 52, which simplifies to 1 over 13. This idea is the basic idea of probability, being able to say the number of ways it could occur divided by the number of all possible things that could happen. It's pretty much the meat and potatoes, and if you take one idea away from this lesson, this is the one idea to take away. And this is the sort of thing that you'll wind up seeing on any standardized test. Pretty much this idea right here is enough for any standardized test, so as long as you keep that one in your mind, you'll be good for all that. We're going to get into some slightly more interesting things as we keep going, but this is the basic fundamental idea you want to hold on to. Equally likely is important. That's a really important phrase. In that previous definition, it was assumed that all possible outcomes were equally likely. So that all the possible outcomes are equally likely. This is a really important requirement for the way we're going to look at probability. Why? Well, let's consider the following scenario. If you dig a hole in the ground, there is a possibility you will find, ground, find gold, right? The sample space then has two possibilities. You find gold or you don't find gold. So we've got an event, which is find gold, and our sample space is find gold, don't find gold. So that means one thing for the event divided by two things for our, the size of our sample space. But clearly, if you dig some random hole, the chance of you finding gold is not one half. 
Why? Because each chance is not equally likely. Each outcome is not equally likely as the other one, right? Find gold is not equal occurrence, equal probability as don't find gold. They're not equally likely outcomes. So because they're not equally likely outcomes, we can't base it off of this idea of number of ways, number of ways of our event divided by number of possible ways anything could happen. Right. So the method that we just talked about for that basic probability thing won't work if this we, we don't have this equally likely thing. So this equally likely thing is a really important first requirement. Now, happily, we're almost certainly never going to see anything that doesn't involve equally likelihood. So all of the problems we're going to wind up seeing are going to be equal likelihood problems. We're going to know that all of the outcomes are equally likely. They might describe it with words like fair, like a fair die or a fair uh, coin or a fair, you know, random number, some something that makes it implies that all of the possibilities are equally likely. A fair die is one that is equally likely to come up one, two, three, four, five, six. All of its outcomes are equally likely. We might also use the word random, right? If something is selected randomly, that's implying that out of the selection, it was equally likely amongst all of them or some other way of saying this. But we can almost always assume that all the possible outcomes are equally likely. And the level of the problems we're going to be working at, this is a pretty reasonable assumption to make, is that we can assume this equally likely thing at the level of the problems we're working at. There's lots of really interesting problems you can work on where this, this assumption won't wind up being true. But for the sort of stuff you'll be required to work on at this point, you can almost always be certain you'll be allowed to assume that everything is equally likely unless they very explicitly tell you otherwise. And that's pretty un... that's not going to happen very often, if at all. All right, interpreting probability. Notice that the probability of an event, p of e equal to n of e divided by n of s, is always less than or equal to 1. This is because n of e less than or equal to n of s. That n of e, the number of ways the event can occur, is always less than or equal to the total number of things that can happen, because all the ways that the event can occur are all inside of the number of uh, the ways that anything could happen, right? So E is always contained within our sample space. The event is always contained within the sample space, just like heads, just like heads was contained inside of heads and tails for the sample space. So the event is always contained inside the sample space. So the number of ways the event can happen is always going to be smaller or equal to the number of things in the sample space total. Okay, so we've got this number then that can be somewhere between 0 and 1, right? The smallest e could be is 0 ways total. So we're somewhere between 0 and 1. How do we interpret this value? We can interpret it like this. We've got this value that can range between 0 to 1. And at 0, it is absolutely impossible for the thing to occur. And at 1, it is absolutely certain that the thing will occur. It will definitely occur at a 1 probability, and it will never occur at a 0 probability. So as we wind up going up the scale, as we go up from 0 to 1, it becomes more and more likely. The closer you get to 1, the more likely it is. And here in the middle at 0 0.5, it is equally likely as unlikely. On average, 1 out of 2 times, it will wind up happening. We can represent probability as a fraction, as a decimal, and as a percentage. Any of these are fine things to do. The important part is that probability is always between 0 and 1 inclusive, because you can be 0 and you can be 1 as a probability, although almost all the ones we're going to deal with will be somewhere in between. We can also interpret probability as the ratio of the event happening over a large number of attempts. For example, if we flip a coin a million times, we can expect about half of the flips to come out heads, right? Because the probability of flipping a fair coin and having it come out heads is 1 out of 2, so 1 half. So on the large scale, we know about half of any large thing will wind up coming out to be that. Now on the small scale, right, if I flip a coin twice, it wouldn't be that surprising for two of them to come out as tails, even though it is a one out of two chance for heads, right? We could flip the coin three times and it wouldn't be that unsurprising for it to come out as tails, tails, tails. It's not super likely, but it's not that unreasonable. So just because the probability is one half for heads doesn't guarantee us that it's going to occur at any time. With probability, we don't have a guarantee of occurrence. We just have likely will occur at certain levels of likelihood. We can only have certainty at a one. So since it's a question of how likely is it, we won't have it show up, we won't have it be as likely to show up unless we look at a larger sample space. We look at a larger number of uh, 
larger number of things that could happen. If we look at it happening a million times, we can be almost sure to have half of them be heads because we've done it so many times, we start to see this happen more and more. On a very small scale, though, we can't be certain that it will wind up showing up, right? You flip a coin three times, might come up tails all three times, but that doesn't imply that the coin isn't fair. It's just how random chance works. All right, one of multiple events occurring. Consider if we wanted to find the probability of rolling a fair six-sided die and having it come up either one or six. Now, we could consider them as separate events, so we'd call them E1 and E6, the event of a one and the event of a six. We can talk about either E1 or E6 occurring with the notation E1 union E6. That's a way of saying E1 or E6 or both. What we're looking for is we're looking for something that happens which is inside of E1, or inside of E6. We can be inside of either of them, so it's a union. So what we're curious to know here, if we're looking for the probability of rolling a five or, a, uh, sorry, rolling a one or a six, we're looking for the probability of E1 union in six. The probability of E1 or E6 or both of them. Notice that E1 and E6 are mutually exclusive events. If one of them occurs, the other one cannot occur. What this means is if we roll a 1, it's impossible to have rolled a 6 just then. If we rolled a 6, it's impossible to have rolled a 1 just then. There's no overlap between them, right? We can't be a 1 and a 6 simultaneously, so they're mutually exclusive events. With this in mind, we see that the probability of E1 or E6 occurring, E1 union E6, just combines their probability. So the probability of E1 union E6 is equal to the probability of E1 plus the probability of E6, right? Because we don't have to worry about them overlapping. It's just, okay, did E1 happen? And then we also could look at, did E6 happen? So the probability of E1 is 1 out of 6. The probability of E6 rolling a 6 is 1 out of 6. We add those two together and we get 1 third as the total probability for what we would have of rolling a 1 or a 6. This idea works in general. Given two mutually exclusive events, A and B, the probability of either one or both occurring, A union B, is given by the probability of A union B is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B. So given that two events can't interfere, they can't, you know, we can't have them both happen simultaneously. If we know that if you are you know, A, then you can't be B, and if you are B, then you can't be A, then if we're looking for either one of them happening, it's just going to be adding the two probabilities together. This is another one of those basic ones that you wind up seeing uh, on tests and homeworks. Um, so this is a good one to remember. So what if the events are not mutually exclusive? That there is some overlap in the event so that you could be an A and B at the same time. For example, let's consider the probability of a fair die coming up strictly below four and or, so it can also be, or coming up even. So the die comes up below four, that is one, two, three, or the die comes up even. So notice there is some overlap in these two events. The die could come up as two, which is below four, and also which is even. So it's both of these at the same time. So it's both of the things. So since it's both of the things, there's overlap between being below four and being even. So to find the probability, we have to take this overlap into account. In two events, A and B, we denote the overlap of both occurring at the same time as A intersect B. That is to say, where A and B are happening at the same time. So where A intersects with B is their area of overlap, where both the things are happening at the same time. We take the possibility of overlap into account as follows. Let A and B be two events. The probability of A or B or both occurring is given by the probability of A union B, that is to say A or B or both occurring, is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A intersect B, that is minus the probability of A and B occurring at the same time time. So this is an interesting formula, but that one that we just talked about where we assume that they're mutually exclusive, that one's much more likely to come up in homework and texts, uh, sorry, homework and tests. You might wind up seeing the formula that we're working on right now, but it's less likely. So if this one doesn't make quite as much sense to you, don't worry about it too much. We're about to see a quick example, though, that'll help explain it, though. So that might help cement it, but don't worry about it too much if this one doesn't make a lot of sense. You're much less likely to see it than the previous one. So our previous example, this example that we are looking for, 1, 2, or 3, or an even number, or both of them, we can let E1, 2, 3, so E1, 2, 3 is the event of rolling a number strictly below 4, which is to say a 1, a 2, or a 3. 
and then E even is rolling in even number. So you roll a two, a four, or a six. Now notice, where does E one, two, three, and E even overlap? These two things overlap at E two, when we roll a two. So if a two comes up on the die, it is below four, and it is even. So E2 is where they overlap each other. So by the above formula, the probability of A union B, the probability of E123 union E even, of having it be either below 4 or even, or both, is equal to the probability of the die coming up as 1, 2, 3, plus the probability of the die coming up even, minus the probability of the die coming up both of these. So the probability of it being 1, 2, 3, and even. So what's the probability of it coming up as 1, 2, 3? Well, 1, 2, 3, so that's three possibilities divided by 6 total on the thing. So it's 3, 6, plus coming up even, 2, 4, 6. So that's three possibilities divided by 6 total. So 3 over 6 as well, minus, and now we can swap since we know that E2 is the same thing as E1, 2, 3, intersect E even. So it's the same thing as just asking, what's the probability of rolling a 2? We combine red and blue together come to be a 1. So 3, 6 plus 3, 6 is 1. And then minus, what's the probability of rolling a 2? Well, that's 1, rolling a 2, divided by 6. So we've got 1, 6. So 1 minus a 6, which comes out to be 5, 6. So we have 5, 6 is the chance of rolling a number that is below 4, or even, or both. Now, 5, 6 makes sense because we can also just go through this and do this by hand, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So notice, if you are 1, 2, or 3, then these ones are good. If you are even 2, five, uh, sorry, 2, 4, and 6, then those ones are good as well. So the only one that fails to be 1, 2, 3, or even, is the number 5. So that means we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 1 here, 2 here, 3 here, 4 here, five possibilities for this event to occur, divided by a total of six possible outcomes. So five divided by six, which is the exact same thing. So this checks out and makes sense. So this formula here makes sense on the small scale, and we can also bring it to a much larger scale for working with a much more complicated problem where we can't just do this by hand and we have to be able to understand the theory to be able to get an answer. All right. What if an event doesn't occur? So if we have some event E, we can also talk about the event of E not occurring. So we have E occurs when the event E occurs, but we could also talk about if E does not occur, let's make that an event, right? E not occurring is now an event as well. We call this the complement of E. So the complement of an event is that event not occurring. And we denote it with E with a little C in the top corner. So E to the C, but not actually raising it like an exponent. It's not the same thing. So E complement. Other textbooks or teachers might de denote this as E with a bar on top or E with a little tick mark. It doesn't matter. Either one, any of them is fine, but I'm going to use EC. For example, if E is the event of rolling an even number on a die, then EC is the opposite event. So in this case, we've got E is an even number. So EC would be the complement when E does not occur. So if E does not occur, the complement, what's the opposite to rolling an even number? That is rolling an odd number. So if you roll an odd number on the die, you are in the complement of the event here. The probability of an event's complement occurring is 1 minus the probability of the original event. So the probability of an event's complement is equal to 1 minus the probability of the original event. Why? Well, either E occurs or it does not. And if it does not, then we know that E complement must occur. So E complement must occur if we wind up having E does not occur. So if E occurs, then E has occurred. If E does not occur, then E complement has occurred. So no matter what, we can be certain that one of them must occur. One of these two things always has to happen. We can't have something in the middle. Either the event happens or the event doesn't happen. So if the event happens or it doesn't happen, well, either way, one of those two things happens. So we are certain that one of them will occur. Since one of them always has to occur, that means the total of their probabilities must be a one, certainty. So the probability of an event's complement plus the probability of the event is equal to one, because one of those two things always has to happen. 
So that's why we wind up having 1 minus the probability of the event gives us the probability of the event not happening. This is a useful idea in a lot of situations. So this is another useful one to remember. Independent events. Consider rolling a die and flipping a coin. How can we find the probability of the die coming up as a 5 or a 6 and the coin coming up heads. To do this, we must consider the probabilities of both events. In the example of the above events, we say that they are independent events because rolling the die has no effect on flipping the coin. Flipping the coin has no effect on rolling the die. They are separate events, and the outcome of one event does not affect the other. So we know that they are independent events in this case. If they are independent events, given two independent events, A and B, the probability of both events occurring, that is to say the probability of A and B occurring, probability A and B, is equal to the probability of A times the probability of B. So we multiply the probabilities of each of them on their own, and that gives us the probability of both of them occurring if they're independent events. In the above example, we would have the probability of an event of a 5 or 6, right, event of a 5 or 6, and the event of a heads is equal to the probability of the event of a 5 or a 6 times the probability of the event of a heads. Well, what's the chance of a 5 or a 6? A 5 or a 6 is going to be 2 out of 6, right? And the probability of a heads is going to be 1 out of 2. We multiply these together and we get 1 sixth, right? This right here this idea of multiplying probabilities together, this is the other really important idea for this lesson. So that very, very basic one of number of ways the event can happen divided by number, total number of things that can occur, that's the first really important idea in this lesson. And the second one is if you've got independent events and you want to figure out the chance of both of them occurring, you just multiply the probabilities of each of them on their own. That one also comes up on tests a lot. That's another very important idea to take away from this. What if the events are not independent, though? What if we're looking at a situation where they aren't actually going to not affect each other, where they can have an effect on each other? So the outcome of one will do something to the outcome of the other, or at least the chances of the outcome of the other. For example, consider if we draw two cards at random from a deck of 52 cards. What is the probability of a pair of aces, that is, both cards come out as aces? In this case, the probability of the second card being an ace is affected by what the first card was because it can change the number of aces in the deck, right? If we pull out a card that is an ace on the first one, then there is now one fewer ace for our second pull. If we don't pull out an ace on the first one, then there's the some, same number of aces in our second pull. So what we do on that first pull affects what will happen in the second pull. We denote conditional probability with this sort of, uh, this sort of symbols, uh, this notation. So the conditional probability of B occurring if A does occur is P of B bar A and thing. So that's how we would say it as just the symbols. But if we want to talk about it, it would be the conditional probability of B occurring if A occurs. Or we could also say this as the probability of B occurring assuming A occurs. So if we can know for sure A will occur, then what is B's chance of occurring with that piece of information already in mind? So this is the idea of conditional probability. So we assume the second guy. The second guy is the assumed one. And the first one is what we're looking at. So what we're looking at. So we assume the second one, P of B, A, conditional probability of B occurring if A, so B bar A. A is going to be assumed. The second thing that shows up is assumed. The first thing is what we're now trying to figure out the probability of if we can have that assumption. All right, so in the above example, we can denote the probability of the second ace being pulled if the first ace has already been pulled. So what's the chance of that second ace coming out if the first ace has already come out? So then we've got our assumed thing is the first ace. And what we're looking for now is what's the probability of that second ace with that assumption there. So probability of second ace assuming a first ace. Given two events A and B where the outcome of A affects the outcome of B, the probability of both events occurring is probability of A and B is equal to the probability of A occurring on its own multiplied by the probability of B occurring assuming that A occurs. So this conditional probability. 
Let's see this as an example. In the previous example, the result of one card affects the result of the second card because it changes what is in the deck. So the probability of that very first ace is 4 out of 52 because there are 4 aces in the deck when we pull it out and there are 52 cards total to pull from. But for the second ace, there is now one less ace and there's one less card if we assume that the first ace, if a ace was pulled on that first draw. So there's one less ace means that we now have three aces to pull from divided by 51 cards that we are pulling from total because now there's just one less card in the deck. Thus, the probability for drawing a pair of aces, if we are looking for the probability of both of these things happening, first ace and a second ace pulled on two cards, then the probability of that first ace times the probability of the second ace, assuming a first ace has already been pulled, is how we get this. We multiply those two together. So the probability of the first ace was 4 over 52, and then we multiply it by the probability of the second ace if we can assume that first ace has already happened. 4 over 52 times 3 over 51, that comes out to be 1 over 221. All right. That idea of conditional events, it's really interesting stuff, but it's also, that's probably the most extreme stuff that you'd wind up seeing on a test. I would doubt that you'd even see that very often, but it's pretty cool. We'll see that in the final example. All right, let's start off with a nice simple example. Given a bag containing four red marbles, seven blue, 11 green, and two purple, what is the chance of a blue marble being drawn randomly from the bag? So we're looking for what is the probability of a blue coming out? So how do we figure out probability? Well, we know that we are doing this, we are drawing randomly. So if it's randomly, we know all of the possibilities are equally likely. That's what that random word means, is that it's a tip-off that says all of these are equally likely, you don't have to worry about it, which means we can use that nice, simple formula. So it's the number of ways the event can occur, so in this case, the number of blues we could pull out. So the number of blue marbles divided by the number of marbles total, all the ways that something can happen. So number, number of marbles total. So in this case, we know how many marbles are there that are blue? Seven are blue, so it's seven divided by how many marbles do we have total? We have four red, we have to include the seven, there's still seven, so they count as some of them, plus seven, plus 11, plus two, so that's all of the marbles totaled together. We work that out. So we've got 7 over 4 plus 7, 11 plus 11, 22 plus 2, 24. So 7 over 24. We can't simplify it anymore, and there is our probability. So a 7 out of 24 chance of pulling a blue marble randomly from the bag. Second example, a class has a breakdown in grades shown by the table below. If a student is selected randomly from the class, so once again, there's that word randomly, means we can just assume everything is equally likely. What is the chance that they have a B or a C? So, if we're doing this, the probability of a B or a C, so probability of a B or a C, well, we can also look at that as the union. So B union C, so it can be B or it can be C, so we could add these together. So that would be equal to the probability of a B plus the probability of a C, because it can be either B or C, and we know that they're mutually exclusive. We don't have to worry about them being B and C simultaneously. So now we can work this out. What's the probability of a B? Well, there are 12 students that have Bs. Let's expand a little bit more. So here's the probability of Bs and then we'll have probability of C's over here. So how many students have Bs? We've got 12 students with Bs divided by how many students do we have total? We've got eight here, 12 here, five here, seven here. So we add them all up together to figure out how many students we have in the class. Eight plus 12 plus five plus seven. And then we add, what's the probability of a C student? Well, a C student has five. There's five C students total in the class. And then once again, we divide it by the number of students total, eight plus 12 plus five plus seven. We work this out, 12 over eight plus 12, 20, plus five, 25, plus seven, 32, plus five over 32 equals 17 over 32. We can't simplify that anymore, so there's our probability. If we draw a student randomly from the class, we have a 17 out of 32 chance of pulling a B or a C student. Next, a bag of marbles contains 12 red marbles along with various others. If you draw a marble from the bag at random, you have a 15% chance of drawing a red one. What is the total number of marbles in the bag? 
So for this, we've got 12 red marbles. We know that if we pull out of the bag at random, we have 15% chance of drawing a red one. So our very first thing is we want to turn 15% as a chance. We can't really work with percentages. We've seen this before. We have to turn them into decimal numbers before we can work with them in math, usually. So 15% we change into 0 0.15. So it's a 0 0.15 probability. Now, if we work this our normal way, then we know that the probability of pulling out a red is equal to the number of reds in the bag divided by the number of marbles total. Right? The total number is on the bottom. So what's the probability of pulling out a red? Well, that's a 0 0.15. What's the probability? How many red are there? There's 12 red marbles. So it's 12 divided by the number total. So the number total is just some number. If we wanted, we could replace it with x or whatever we felt like. I'm just going to keep writing number total because we know it's just a number that we're working with. So we multiply both sides by number total. So number total will cancel out on the denominator on the right and appear on the left. And we divide both sides by 0 0.15. So now we have 12 over 0 0.15. We use a calculator to figure out what is 12 divided by 0 0.15. That comes out to be 80. So we know that the total number of marbles in the bag is 80 marbles because we were guaranteed that if we pull out randomly from the bag, there is going to be a 15% ch chance of drawing a red one, and we knew how many red marbles we started with. It's probability with just a slight spin of algebra on it. Fourth example, if you roll three fair six-sided dice, so fair means that all of the sides are equally likely, what is the chance of a six coming up on each die? on none of the dice, and finally, on at least one of the dice. So first, let's say we're looking at all dice. So six, six on all. So if it's going to be a six on all of them, then it's the question of what's the first one? Well, the second one is an independent event of the first one. And the third one is an independent event of the first two, right? One die's result does not affect the result of the next die, does not affect the result of the next die. They're independent events. So what's the chance of one die coming up as a six? It's one out of six. What's the chance of the next die coming up as a six? It's one out of six. The chance of the next die coming up as six? It's one out of six. So. By our rule about independent events, it's multiply them together. If they're independent events, and you want to know what the probability of them all occurring is, you just multiply all the probabilities together. So 1 6 times 1 6 times 1 6. We work that out. That comes out to 1 over 216. So it's a 1 out of 216 chance of getting a 6 on all of the dice. Next, what if we want to do none of the dice? So none. If it's none of the dice, well, what's the chance? of getting no sixes on any die. Well, that would be one, two, three, four, five are the things that are allowed to come up. So we have five possibilities divided by six, the total number of things that could happen. And that's going to be the same for the second die and the third die. So five over six times five over six times five over six. We could also write this as five cubed divided by six cubed. We work that out with a calculator and we get 125, actually you probably don't need a calculator for that, 125 divided by 216. So the chance of getting no sixes on any dice is 125 divided by 216. Finally, at least one of the dice. So this might be the one that seems hardest at first, but it's actually easy once we know this part right here, if we know none of them. So remember what we talked about before with the complement of an event. If an event does not happen, then we're talking about the event complement happening. So if E does not happen, then EC does happen. So if none of the dice happens, then there is no sixes on any of them. But if none of the dice does not happen, that is to say we don't roll a six on none of the dice, then that means we've rolled a six on one of the dice or more. So at least one is going to be the probability of the complement to the none event. So what we talked about before was the probability of none complement is equal to one minus the probability of none. So another way of looking at it is just if you know what the probability of an event is, then the probability of the opposite thing happening is 1 minus the probability of that event. That's what this none complement thinks, is the opposite of that event occurring. So we know 1 minus, we just figured out what's the probability of none occurring. It's 125 over 216. So we get 91 
out of 216 is the chance that at least one of the dice will come up with a six on it. Final example, a poetry class has 17 boys and 13 girls. If the teacher randomly selects four students from the class, what is the chance that they will all be boys? So this is the idea of conditional probability. So we've got some first thing that's going to happen. But then the second thing is going to also be affected by that first thing. And then the third thing is going to be affected by that second and the first thing. And then the fourth thing is going to be affected by that first, second, third thing as well. So what we do is we figure out the probability of the first thing, then we multiply it by the probability of the second thing, assuming that first thing. And then we multiply that by the probability of the third thing, assuming those first two things. And then we multiply that by the probability of the fourth thing, assuming those first three things. That's how conditional probability worked when we talked about it earlier. So if we start off, how many students are total in the class? Well, if we've got 17 boys and 17, 13 girls, we assume we've got 30 total. So if we have 30 total, then for the first one, we've got 17 out of 30. But for the next one, we pull out one of the students. We've pulled out one boy, so that means we now only have 16 boys. How many students do we have total? Our total of students has also gone down by one because we've already used one of the students. We pulled out a boy, he's still one of the students in the class, so we've now reduced from 30 to 29 students in the class. Next, we pull out another boy. We are going to now be at 15 boys, divided by, we pull out another student, 28. Finally, our fourth boy, we're now at 14 boys left to pull from, and we are now at 27 students total in the classroom after our three pulls so far. So if we want to figure this out, conditional probabilities, we just multiply them all together. So 17 over 30 times 16 over 29 times 15 over 28 times 14 over 27. We work that out, and that winds up simplifying to the not that simple looking 68 over 783, which comes out approximately to 0 0.087. So we have a little bit less than a 10% chance, 0.087 chance, of managing to pull all boys if we pull four students. It drops down pretty quickly. The first boy is a 17 out of 30 chance, but we drop down pretty quickly by the time we're at the fourth boy. It is a less than 1 in 10 chance. All right, cool. So that finishes up for all of our stuff about combinatorics in here, our ideas of counting and permutations, combinations, probability. Hope you've got a reasonable grounding. This is all the basics that you need for this level of math, but there is a huge, huge amount of stuff to explore out there. If you thought this stuff was interesting, just do a quick search on combinatorics. You'll find out all sorts of cool things. There's all sorts of really cool stuff in combinatorics, how to count things, lots of cool ideas in math. All right, we'll see you at educator.com for the next lesson. Bye.